House the House will come to order. With no objection, we will revert to messages from the Senate. There's a motion at the desk. The clerk will report the motion. Winkler moves that Rule 1.15, Paragraph C, relating to disposition of Senate files, be suspended for the purpose of taking the message from the Senate relating to House File Number 2. Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, members, I ask for your support. This allows us to waive the 12-hour concurrence rule, and we can take this bill up immediately. All those in favor of the Winkler motion, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. The motion prevails. No. Representative Winkler. Oh. You're good. Okay. okay. Message from the Senate. The clerk will report the, the motion. Message from the Senate, Madam Speaker. I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file, herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendments the concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file number 33, an act relating to health. The message is signed Calar Ludeman, Secretary of the Senate. Liebling moves that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House File Number 33 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. Representative Liebling. Good evening, members. Mr. Speaker, thank you. That is my motion. And, um, Mr. Speaker, I would like to begin this evening. Uh, just with a little background on this bill, we have been, as uh, everyone knows, we had a um, conference committee that met during the regular session. We actually passed a conference report, which was signed into law, um, and then we convened as a working group after that. And there have been a number of members who've been working to put together the HHS bill that is before you tonight. It's been a very long slog, but I'm really, really pleased to bring this bill to you tonight. This is, I would say, the best HHS bill that we may see in a generation. It is that good of a bill. Now, does that mean that it doesn't have some disappointments? No. Are there going to be some things that some members might disagree with? Of course. But this is a bill that is really going to do so well for Minnesotans, and every member can be very, very proud of this bill. So I would like to start out with a few thank yous because um, this has been just an extraordinary effort. And first of all, we always talk about the work of our House nonpartisan staff. And this year, they're with, with between working remotely and um, the incredible size and complexity of this bill, they have just been extraordinary. So Elizabeth Clark Vist, Sarah Sunderman, Randy Chun, Danielle Punelli, and Annie Mock, thank you so much for your hard work. And especially to Doug Berg, our House Fiscal Analyst, if members have the spreadsheet in front of you, you get a sense of how complicated this particular HHS bill has been. Because un unlike the usual year, we have a great deal of new federal money coming into the state, a lot of which is being allocated in this bill. And it was no easy task. There were complications upon complications. And Mr. Berg just did incredible work to get this together. Of course, our partisan researchers, Joe Durheim and Molly Peterson on the DFL side, and Jeremiah Wingstead on the Republican side, do incredible work for us. And of course, um, my committee legislative assistant, Krista Niedernhofer, and most of all, our committee administrators. This bill is really three bills in one. We know that. And so we had three different committee administrators working on it, and they have done more work than a person could expect of anyone. Um, it, it has just been a, an amazing effort. And so uh, Ying Yia Wang, who worked with Representative Schultz, Polly Sirk who worked with Representative Pinto, 
Patrick McQuillan, who's my committee administrator, has done amazing work. And I especially want to call out Chris McCall, who is not one of our committee administrators for these committees, but has stepped up every step of the way to help us out. So why then do I say that this is such an amazing bill? I'm just going to run through some provisions that are in it just to give you a flavor of what a, an amazing accomplishment this really is. So one of the banners on the bill, and I have talked to Senator Benson, I have said to her many times that one of the big banners on this bill is going to be what it does for families and children. And it does. There are many great provisions in here. So we have extended postpartum coverage under medical assistance from 60 days to 12 months. This was carried by Representative Morrison. We have the Dignity in Pregnancy and Childbirth Act from Representative Richardson, which has the potential to close some of the disparities in maternal and child health, and especially in maternal and infant mortality in our state. Expanding integrated care for high-risk women, another Richardson bill. We have the, the, um, the bill from um, Representative Moran and Hollins. Representative Hollins picked this up this year that fixes a problem in our family foster care to align it with adoption standards. This is something that's going to allow people to be foster parents for their own relatives, people who previously would have been disallowed because of our, the way our foster care standards were put together. So this is going to help families stay together and reduce trauma in our children. We have a provision to expand lead risk assessments. I think most members would know that how dangerous lead is for our children and how it can cause lifelong disability, and we're going to do better as a state on that. We have better outreach for preventative care under medical assistance, trying to get the children and teens in for the checkups to which they are entitled to make sure that they, can, that they are growing and developing as they should. We have a provision in here for um, what's called CMV, sometimes called Vivian's Act, which is going to help us recognize um, cytometal, cytomegalovirus, CMV, a, a fairly common virus that can cause a great deal of disability in newborns. And um, Representative Bolden carried this bill, and Rec Representative Wolgamont was dogged in pressing to get this bill through. So the Department of Health is going to do some outreach starting immediately, and then we're going to see if we're going to add this to our newborn screening that we do so well here in the state. Um, we've got an expansion of home visiting, not as much money as we'd like, but this is something that Representative Bonner was just an absolute champion for. And very importantly, we have a new asthma benefit for kids with severe asthma on our medical assistance program. This was carried by Representative Morrison, a very important provision because kids with severe asthma, if, if any of you have asthma or your children have, you know how devastating this can be. And this new benefit will really help reduce the asthma that children experience. And we're so looking forward to that. One of the biggest improvements in this bill is in the area of dental care. And I'm looking at you, Representative Grunhagen. I know you've cared about this for a long time, and many members have. We've had many, many discussions over the years on dental care, what to do, how to improve it. We've struggled with this for years. This is the year we're going to do something about it. And it's in this bill. So we have a number of things. Representative Ryer has a provision in the bill to bring together a group to, to dis, um, talk about dental homes and try to find a new way to deliver dental services that will be more efficient and get better outcomes. That's the first thing. We're adding back the adult periodontal coverage. This was Representative Bierman carried this bill. This is something that was taken away some years ago during budget cuts and really a very important benefit for people if, if they need this coverage. Um, and then the, the real keystone here 
is on a, um, what we're doing with dental care in terms of raising rates. So we had, um, this has been uh, something we've been working on throughout the entire session, through this special session, trying to get a deal on raising rates and having some standards in place for our managed care organizations to actually do better, to get more of our people in to see the dentist so that we can really make an impact here. And so we are raising rates immediately, and we're going to, everyone's rates, the base rate is going to be raised by 98%, and the critical access folks are still going to get a 20% add-on on top of that new base, so no dental providers will see a decrease. Everybody is a winner here. But most importantly, we are not throwing in money without reform. What we're doing is putting in a new standard, and we are holding the managed care organizations to it. And in three years, if they do not reach the standard, the state will go to a single dental administrator. So this is something the dental community has been asking for for many, many years, to go to a single administrator. So for the very first time, we have a real stick and a real standard to improve dental care under our medical assistance program. And then finally, in our, in our um, at least finally in this area, we talk a lot about provider rates. And under managed care, legislators do not know how much providers get paid. We talk about it all the time. We talk about the impact of rates. We debate it on the House floor. But the reality is none of us really know how much those providers are getting paid. So in this bill, there's a small provision that I carried for reporting of provider rates. So for the very first time since I've been here, we will actually know, at least in aggregate, how much the, the managed care organizations are paying to various categories of providers. So I'm sure the debates will continue, but at least we'll have some real information to base them on. So, Another very important provision is a provision to um, reinstate or instate coverage for weight loss drugs under medical assistance. So weight loss drugs are a very important part of obesity care. And obesity care is covered under medical assistance. You can get bariatric surgery under medical assistance. But up until now, you could not get coverage for drugs to assist in, in dealing with this chronic disease. And um, this is something that Representative Bernardi's been working on for quite a few years. And this year, we finally have this in the bill. And this is a big equity issue as well. And for teenagers who are obese, this can have lifelong impacts on their health. So I'm so pleased. Um, we've got some money in the bill for tobacco and vaping prevention. And then a few provisions I won't go into too deeply, but we have the expansion of telehealth, which we were able to start right away, starting with the new fiscal year. There won't be a gap. We did get some assistance from some of the federal funds that are coming into the state to be able to do this. And um, we will be sunsetting parts of it in a couple of years. And very importantly, we're investing resources into studying the issue. So we will have the opportunity as a legislature to actually know what we're doing when we decide whether to extend different parts of telehealth and exactly what to do in um, whether audio only should be extended, whether it should be paid the same as other kinds of service, and so on. And we'll have real information, which I'm very pleased about. Um, very important thing in this bill, another one of the banners, will be that this bill does a lot to improve our public health system. So the, the COVID pandemic has really shown us that we have weaknesses in our public health system. We were not prepared as a state. A lot of our public health is run through local public health agencies. And these agencies, because they depend a lot on local funding, and they really vary depending on the size of the county they're in, um, they really, many of them are understaffed and, and we're not ready. In fact, 
What we're doing in this bill, and I'm very pleased that Senator Benson was uh, truly a partner in this in putting some real funds into local public health, not only putting more funds into the grants ongoing to just raise the base for all of our local public health agencies, but also to create a grant process to drive innovation, to actually improve, so that when the next emergency happens, we'll be better prepared. And this is uh, one of the real banner things about the bill. Um, and finally, one thing that I will um, mention here is members know that we have problems, especially in rural areas, where it, it can be very hard to find, uh, to have hospital care nearby, to have a clinic nearby, sometimes to find maternity care. And we know that this impacts the economy of our state because when you are a young couple and you want to move to a town, um, it may be a concern that you have. Are you going to be able to get maternity care if you want to start a family and so on? So there is a provision in the bill for the first time that when a hospital closes its facilities and is going to move out of a town, that it has to give a, a notice to the Department of Health and a hearing has to be held so that the community has an opportunity to hear about closures and weigh in. Now, this doesn't stop the closures. We, we couldn't go that far. But it does give communities a little more say and a little more opportunity to have an impact on this very important aspect of their lives. And I believe this will be particularly important for rural communities. And finally, we have a provision that was championed by Representative Schultz called the Family Glitch. And the Family Glitch is a provision that is going to allow more families who are right now not able to buy insurance and get, um, get subsidies for their insurance through MNsure because they don't qualify. Um, they, they, um, I'm, actually, I should let her, I'm gonna let her explain it. <laughs> it's late and she's much better at explaining it than I am. But anyway, this is very important because many more families in Minnesota are going to be able to afford coverage. And I know that's something that all members here on the floor consider very important. Um, so there are so many more things in this bill. Um, I could probably talk for a few hours here, but I don't think anybody wants me to do that. So Mr. Speaker, I'm going to sit down and allow some of my colleagues to talk a little more about the bill and just going to ask members to please concur and uh, then hopefully we can repass the bill this evening. Thank you. Discussion. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to get the thank yous out of the way before I forget and then talk about the wonderful provisions on the human services side of the bill. Well, we can bring you such a phenomenal bill because we have a really strong team. We work together very well to bring this bill to the floor. So first, I just want to thank our nonpartisan staff, Danielle Punelli, Elizabeth Clarkvist, Sarah Sunderman, Ann Mock, and Randy Chun, our state employees at DHS and MDH. I'm continually impressed by their dedication and work ethic. I want to particularly thank Christy Grom, Elise Bailey, Dave Greeman, and Matt Burdick. I want to thank our fiscal staff, Doug Berg, who slugged through many, many versions of budget tracking sheets and uh, spreadsheets um, that ran more than 40 pages. And I want to thank especially our own staff, many who sacrificed time with their loved ones and worked 15 plus hour days for at least eight weeks to improve the lives of Minnesotans. My CLA, Lindsay Hansen, researchers Joe Durheim and Molly Peterson, my committee administrator, Yingya Vang, the first time she's a CA and she's thrown into HHS, Polly Sergvenik, Chris McCall, and Patrick McQuillan. I want to also thank members of the Human Services Committee, particularly Vice Chair Bonner and the GOP lead, Representative Albright, and all of our members who worked on important HHS bills. 
I thank Senators Abler and Benson for working together to bring first a committee report during regular session and now this phenomenal bill. And finally, I want to thank our advocates who continuously remind us of the needs of Minnesotans. Thank you. Frankly, this is the best health and human services bill I've seen during my tenure in the legislature. And it's not because Chair Leveland and I worked on the bill. It's because we are providing a lot of good things for the people of Minnesota. We're moving Minnesota forward to support individuals to live independently. We're funding services and supports for children, adults, people with disabilities, older adults, and families. We're addressing health inequities and providing funding for homelessness and economic supports, giving families opportunities to thrive. I'm going to run through just a few things, not everything, in the human services side. First, we're funding rate increases for personal care assistance, PCAs. We're ratifying the SEIU contract. We're putting more than $250 million to PCAs. That's more than a 10% rate increase, and Representative Lippert championed this bill this session. We're allowing PCAs to drive their clients as a reimbursable expense. Representative Frederick worked on this issue. We're allowing uh, family PCA services for, for, so parents and, and um, spouses can serve as PCAs and get reimbursed. Representative ACOM worked on that. We're also um, giving enhanced PCA rates to those who need more than 10 hours of services rather than 12. There's rate increases for intermediate care facilities of 5%. Representative Edelson worked on this bill. We're increasing the elderly waiver rate. The customized living rate floor for facilities serving more than 80% of elderly waiver clients is increasing. We're increasing the rates for home health care provided by home care nursing. Also making annual adjustments to those rates. Representative Aikam worked on this. There's a 5% rate increase for substance use disorder treatment services provided by culturally specific and culturally responsive programs. Representative Thompson worked on this issue. There's money that Representative Ryer worked on for adult mental health initiatives. And finally, Representative Rasmussen's bill for rates for crisis stabilization is in the bill. Other provisions that are notable, we're implementing Family First to keep families together. We're implementing Waiver Reimagine Phase 2 so people have an individual budget. They know how much they have to spend for services and what is left. We're also reducing the complexity of the waiver programs. We're funding many, many grants. I'm going to name a few. Customized Living Quality Improvement Grants. Representative Moeller worked on this. Parent-to-parent -parent programs, Parenting with a Disability that Representative Fisher worked on. Self-advocacy grants for those with developmental disabilities. And the Recovery Community Organization funding that Representative Jordan worked on. We're Repaying county and tribal governments for overpayments, and Representative Olson worked on this issue. Uh, Representative Cagle worked on self-employment income modification for cash, cash assistance. Representative Knorr worked on a homeless youth report. And members, we had close to $700 million to spend on home and community-based services from the federal government, so we were able to bring into the bill 19 new provisions. I'm just going to highlight a few of those provisions. One, we're putting money to phase out sub-minimum wage to persons with disabilities. We're creating a um, home and community-based services workforce package to address the challenges related to recruiting direct care workers. We're putting a small amount of funding in a joint initiative by the Department of Corrections and DHS to connect individuals who are released from correctional facilities with housing and health care. We're providing funding for up to 100 counties, tribes, and community organizations to become age-friendly communities. There's money for housing transitional support, such as helping individuals with deposits, utility setup, essential furnishings for people who use our housing stabilization services, we're expanding the mobile crisis infrastructure of the state. And finally, we're funding research 
on how to finance long-term care services and supports. So members, those are just a few highlights. I urge you to read the bill. I thank everyone for being here tonight. I urge your support on this historic, phenomenal investment in human services for the state of Minnesota. The representative from Ramsey, Representative Pinto. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, it's been an honor to work with Chairs uh, Liebling and Schultz and the other chairs on this on this just extraordinary bill. Um, Chair Liebling uh, thanked uh, my committee administrator, Polly Sirk-Vanek, and Doug Berg, and Annie Mock from House Research, but I want to note um, and thank a couple of uh, early childhood staffers in particular, uh, our committee legislative assistant, Shanika Chambers, Emily Adrians with House Fiscal, and then our partisan researchers for early childhood committee who double on the education side as well, uh, Marsville Trondi Rudquist and Jody Withers for the Republicans, and I know that they both provide great service for, uh, for their members and for the state. Um, members, uh, I also just want to, uh, to note as chair of the Early Childhood Committee how excited I am about some of the investments that we have for moms and babies in this bill. Um, there are many, but just a couple. The home visiting proposal from uh, Representative Bonner, we have an increase for home visiting. And Representative Richardson brought forth a number of initiatives to support pregnancy and healthy infant development. These are in the bill, which is just wonderful. Uh, members, my focus, of course, has been on early care and learning, and I want to remind us all that that area has been in crisis since well before the pandemic. Uh, unaffordable, even inaccessible for families and paying poverty wages for, for the providers and teachers. Um, and again, this was, this was before the pandemic. And so, members, um, that has had an impact on parents. We know that even after the pandemic, we have a workforce shortage. That's because parents have trouble finding child care. Um, we know that we have a challenge for, uh, for employers, as I say, and then for kids of course as well and compare the comments and discussion we had regarding the E-12 bill. Um, so fortunately in March, uh, President Biden proposed and Congress passed the American Rescue Plan and provided significant federal funding for child care. Members, in this bill, we stretch those federal dollars just about as far as you possibly could. This bill contains a stabilization and expansion of our child care supply, monthly payments for providers and grants to expand the supply of child care. And this actually coordinates with some funds in the Workforce Development Bill. Uh, and I want to thank Chair Noor and, and Representative Olson for their work in that area. And we have tons and tons of innovation and reform in this bill. Uh, there are some regulatory reforms from the Family Child Care Task Force that was chaired by Representative Wozlowick and Representative Damoth uh, on the GOP side served in that as well. Um, just a ton there. There's a governance report to consolidate programs in early care and learning, early childhood. These are fragmented throughout multiple agencies. We need to get them in the same place. And then there is the Great Start for All Minnesota Children Task Force, championed by Representative Bolden, originally proposed um, from work from Representative Katiza Watoon will put us on a path to have affordable, high-quality child care for all families and paying livable wages for workers. Uh, and then finally, there are ex exciting increases in rates for low-income families to afford child care. Um, we are prioritizing infants and toddlers, increasing rates to the 40th percentile of the survey of providers in a given community. And um, we are uh, reducing the waiting list um, members as well for that area. Now, this is all terrific. It's going to help to stanch the bleeding in these crises, the crises that I referenced. It is important to note this is entirely with federal funding. Every dollar. We actually are a net contributor to the general fund spending in the HHS bill from the early childhood area. Um, so we, uh, very good that that's true. On the other hand, um, it's, uh, we need to think about ways in which we can have state investments uh, in coming years. And the rates, I want to note, are still well below the median in our communities, um, and well below, and quite a bit below that for older children. Uh, the federal, feds recommend 75th percentile. We're down at the 40th and the 30th. And of course, we're digging out for a massive hole. We've got thousands of children and families who are still going to need affordable and high-quality child care. Uh, so there's a lot more to do, but members, in the same way that the earliest years of life lay a foundation for what follows, members, this bill lays an extremely sturdy foundation for the future. By getting more children off to an even better start, um, that will allow parents to work, employers to expand, communities to thrive now and long, long into the future. Members, we can all be really proud of this bill. I encourage your support of the concurrence and then on final passage as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Discussion. Okay. Representative Garofalo, I see that uh, you're requesting to speak. Is that for the motion before us, or do you wish to speak during third reading? Uh, that is on the motion before us, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Representative Garofalo. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Before members vote on the concurrence motion, I do have some fiscal questions. If Representative Liebling would yield for a question. She will yield. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker and Representative Liebling. Uh, line 21 of the spreadsheets shows some interactions with the Health Care Access Fund. Can you just explain uh, what those are? Representative Liebling, let's give her a second here. She has a lot of paper on her desk. And this, Mr. Speaker and Representative Liebling, just to make sure that we're working out the same document, uh, I'm looking at the Health Human Services Budget uh, 2021 Session Proposal Tracking Sheet. Uh, this is on Senate File 2380, House File 2128, and it's dated today at 8.01 p.m. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Garofalo. I'm not sure I understand what exactly your question is, Representative Garofalo, but there are, I have to say, and uh, members, this you heard me refer before to um, Mr. Berg and how complicated this whole thing is. Um, there are a lot of complex interactions in this bill. There is no question about it. And um, so I don't know. I guess I, I'd have to ask Representative Garofalo to kind of state the question a little bit more specifically because I don't, I don't really know how to address it. Thank Representative you. Garofalo, you want to give another try? You bet, Mr. Speaker and Representative Liebling. On line 21 of the fiscal, fiscal spreadsheet in fiscal year 2023, there's parentheses around the number 382,715,000 from the Health Care Access Fund. Uh, what does that represent? Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Represent Mr. Speaker, Representative Garofalo for restating that. So that gave me a moment to kind of orient myself. So one of the things that's happening here is under the American Rescue Plan, there's some interactions with our, um, our basic health plan, which is Minnesota Care. Um, and so there is a, um, there's money coming in that um, we, we were required to reduce premiums and then there's extra money coming in for the BHP. And that shows up in the healthcare access fund as a saving. So I think that that is what you're referring to. Okay, and Mr. Speaker? Yes, Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Liebling. So with that savings, um, when I look at the line 25, the healthcare access fund ending balance, um, we see that there is a spike in the projected balance. The February forecast had it at 183 million. Then on line 25, we see 566 million. However, when we go out into the tails into fiscal year 25, uh, despite all those interactions, those hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, I'll use your word, savings, we see there's only $33 million left in the balance of the health care access fund in fiscal year 25. So where is, where is that money going? If, if, if Representative Liebling would answer that question. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Representative Garofalo, I'm not sure I can give you a precise answer, but there is another spot in the spreadsheet that I can direct you to line 1033 that talks about um, where it's more specifically laid out what's happening with the BHP revenue that I was mentioning to you. And I think that the spending there, a lot of it, and the reason it goes down again is because it is being spent on the, um, the BHP as it is supposed to be. So, but I, I, um, I'm sorry I can't give you a more precise answer on that. This is, uh, a very complicated interaction, and I don't think that Mr. Berg is available here on the House floor for me to go and get the answer from him. He's probably yeah. asleep, which he should be. <laughs> um, Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Liebling, and I don't, I don't want to have a, an extended debate on this. Um, obviously, these are more fiscal questions that we should be addressing in um, the um, Ways and Means Committee. But I do want to highlight, um, and I think, Representative Liebling, I believe you know this, and I think members of the body know this, um, that there's, um, this is a completely fiscally unsustainable bill. Uh, the projected growth in spending, and I'm trying to calculate, um, just having you know, two and a half hours to look at this, 
Uh, there is no revenue stream to the state of Minnesota that is growing as fast as the spending in this bill. And certainly the federal uh, money that's helicoptered in is going to uh, paper over some of those costs. But this is a, this is a fiscally irresponsible act. Voting for this bill is, is unsustainable. It spends us into oblivion. It spends us into bankruptcy, which I guess some may view as a, their attempt. So I'll be voting no on the motion to concur. I'd be voting no on final passage. And I would strongly encourage uh, those members who uh, have a fiscally conservative background of opposing this bill as well. Uh, you can't have government spending growing faster than projected revenues. And there is no revenue stream to the state of Minnesota that can possibly meet the, uh, the absolute spendosaurus rex level of spending that is in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Liebling. Discussion. Okay, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to concur with the Senate amendments say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by the Senate. House file yeah. number 33, third reading as amended by the Senate. That was like an I doing Yeah, third reading. Discussion. Representative from Scott, Representative Albright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Chair Liebling and Chair Schultz, Chair Pinto. Um, I, I can certainly appreciate the monumental task that you have undertaken to bring this bill uh, to this floor as amended. As was stated earlier today, it went out, it came back in, and it is now $19 billion, 40% of the state's budget. There are some provisions in here that I find valuable. Let me just point those out. New requirements to allow the state to better oversee managed care plans, comparing them with the service that they provide. It's always beneficial to understand what you're paying for. And so I laud that effort. It is notable that you're providing for a one-time $435 payment to MFIP. You're eliminating the, flam the family glitch. One of the more notable points that I actually am I'm heartened to see, and I worked with Representative uh, Morrison on this one, was the extension of the postpartum uh, supports uh, for the mom, the mother, the new mom, and the child. Telehealth. I think with the advent of COVID and what occurred there, we certainly have been witness to how critical telehealth has been to the people that were shut in, estranged from their care providers, because of, of COVID. And so I think that's a beneficial attribute of this plan. Clearly there are some things in this bill that our side of the aisle cannot support. It doesn't include, or excuse me, if it does, the reinsurance extension. Now, let me just go back and talk about historically how we got to needing reinsurance. In 2013, this body approved Minsure as an outcome of Obamacare. And one of the provisions in that uh, piece of legislation was that 
insurers had to walk into the room blind because the opportunity for underwriting had been negated. And so they really were flying blind in terms of what those rates were. And from a corporate reinsurance actuarial perspective, when you don't know what your experience is going to be, you have to price it in such a way that you feel you'll cover your outlay. And when the experience came in over the next several years, it was evident that the, 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 the pool of participants in that had much higher experience ratings than the insurance companies ever thought were going to occur, hence reinsurance. So when people say we shouldn't be in the reinsurance business, we kind of made our own bed when we said that you couldn't put people through underwriting. You placed insurance companies at such a hobbled perspective in terms of how they were pro to provide insurance to these people that reinsurance really was the only out that we could provide for what we had done to them. This bill does very little to rein in the growth of spending in the health care sector of the state. As Representative Garofalo just explained, the growth of this budget cannot be sustained based upon the rates of growth in the revenue in this state. It is without question a train wreck waiting to happen. We expand MNCARE, an exacer exacerbation of what I just got done talking about, which will cripple the individual market for anyone outside of MNSURE or MNCARE. Representative Liebling, you did, and Representative Schultz, you did say that this invests in a number of areas targeted to the most vulnerable populations, and I applaud you for that. We often talk in both of those committees about three different people groups, the ones in the dawn of life, the ones in the twilight of life, and those that are in the shadows of life. And so I tip my hat to you for the work and the effort that you put into those that are in the shadows of life. You are also taking care of the people that provide the care to those people. You're increasing their reimbursements, you're increasing their, their pay, and you're providing grants to give individuals with disabilities a better opportunity at independence. That is laudable. There are some issues in this bill that I think give me pause because it goes to a greater, larger issue. I remember in 2013, I wasn't too far from the seat I now um, uh, sit in, and Chair Huntley was right over there when he brought uh, the first of many bills to move us into the Minsure age. And I asked him, when the federal money runs out, what does the state do then? And Chair Huntley said, don't worry. The feds will always take care of us. And it reminded me of a story much like in the Bible where manna fell from heaven but the manna stopped at some point, and then they had to figure out how to feed themselves. And I fear, 
as an extension of our abundance of federal money from an, any number of serv uh, sources that have come into the state of Minnesota in the last several months. I wonder if we're setting expectations for this state on behalf of the people that we are providing new services to which are unsustainable. And in fact, I don't wonder, I know we are. Because when that manna stops falling or the reserve on the federal money runs dry, what will this state do then to continue those programs? Representative Garofalo said, this is unsustainable, not only from a financial perspective, but from the expectations that these folks will have, even if it is in two or three years. The manna will not continue because the financial crisis that will be placed upon this state will be untenable. I worry about the, the expectations that you are creating for people, rightly or wrongly, that will need these services and now are going to receive heightened services, but for a temporary purpose and a temporary timeline. Chair Liebling and, and Chair Schultz, uh, you both have said that you are extremely pleased with what this does for families and children. But sadly, one of the provisions in this bill puts children at incredible undue risk. And I refer to Section 245C, which talks about the exemptions provided to foster care parents and those that are eligible to be foster care providers. You have removed the prohibition to be a foster care provider to those that have been convicted of incest. You can look it up. It was in the bill and then it was out of the bill. A vote tonight to approve this bill will allow convicted felons of incest to be eligible to become foster care parents. That's unconscionable. And I don't know why you have not caught that. That is on you. Members, we have offered opportunities, offered insights, offered direction on a number of provisions in this bill. And they have fallen on deaf ears. This bill received a informational hearing yesterday morning. And even the chair who was presenting the bill at the time said, I, I know it'll be hard to form any questions with the timing and the largesse of this bill. This is not how 40% of our state's budget should be handled. I don't know what kind of a deal you struck with the other chamber, but any time that they do your heavy lifting to bring it back so that we can have an opportunity to offer additional comment or insight changes to this bill, That is very troublesome.
and it didn't have to be. Members, a vote tonight to support and approve this bill will raise health care costs for thousands of individuals. That's a fact. You are going to reduce the number of choices that those people have, and you're going to destabilize the health insurance that people have been relying on and look to rely on when they need it the most. Members, I urge a red vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The representative from Rock, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. A lot of what I have to uh, say on this bill, uh, Representative Albright had already alluded to, so you'll hear some of those same things just without the silver hair on top. Uh, we are happy to see this bill come forward and have that uh, uh, agreement be found and, and ready to go, uh, especially after what we had seen earlier today. Uh, one thing of interest to note is that the title of this bill is actually longer than what the bill that went off the floor originally was in its entirety. So um, a little bit bigger coming back, and I think we expected some of that um, as we came through here. Uh, Representative Liebling and Representative Schultz, um, out of everything, I really do want to congratulate you on the dental rates and getting that piece settled. I know that was um, just something that was probably coming through even throughout the day today to try and get that settled out. I know there was a lot of back and forth on that. And it was the last sticking point to get this wrapped up. And so congratulations um, on that uh, above everything else to get that. Uh, through the, the bill that we have in front of us, we are happy to see that the final agreement that was here does include the ICFDD rate increases that uh, we've have wanted to see for many years, the CCAP rates that always seem to get through the, the chambers and then not uh, through the conference committee and back. We're happy to see that happen. The PCA rates, uh, elderly waiver rates, which has been a, a long time coming as well, to see something uh, like that happen this year was good. Uh, the telehealth reform that came through this year, obviously we're in a year where we could, where it uh, made this issue uh, more of a forefront piece. and. How we move forward with that, it's something that is permanent, something that looks towards the future. We have that in this bill, and so we're, we're happy to see that. Reforms to the child care licensures, we are uh, happy to see that. That's something that we've uh, been working on and, and wanting to see done and is a continual process throughout our, our time here, and to see more of that happen this year is, is something that's welcomed. Um, the, the reinsurance piece, having that in here, um, it's not what we had wanted to see, and uh, I think some would argue that it's, it's not going to do what, what we're hoping it will do, but to see that be acknowledged and, and be part of that final uh, agreement is, is I think, a, a good piece to see. These are things that we have, as a legislature, tried to support over the years. The, these things that are in this bill and that portion, um, whether we have a surplus or we have a deficit, these are things we've continued to try and focus on. And so glad to see that those pieces are in there. But members, we do have uh, some concerns to share with this bill. And uh, the reason I'll be voting no today and encourage others to vote no on this agreement is uh, for some of the pieces that are following. First, the expansion of the state subsidized Minnesota Care Insurance Program for people who have access to other insurance. Also, uh, the fact that we have the MFIP cash grants being put on autopilot and not having the, the state um, have any say in that as it moves forward, just going on in the automatic inflator. We have the one-time payment for MFIP that's in here, the $435. That's on top of the stimulus dollars that have come through, and it is regardless of what's already been received for stimulus. This is just additional st stimulus, and we have uh, really uh, some concerns with just where that and how that gets spent. There's the bailout of DHS for the errors that were uh, found by the federal government in 2019 that I spoke of uh, earlier today when the bill went out. And to fix that mistake is going to cost taxpayers about $37 million. 
And then as Representative Albright uh, referred to, there are concerns that we have with the rule change for foster care parents and the qualifications and what are disqualifiers in the 245C.15 that's found in the uh, mid pages, uh, page 94 to 97 here. Uh, when it lists out the disqualifying crimes and conduct for family foster care, now, some of the sections established uh, permanent disqualifiers, while others have a limited length of time of disqualifications, and there were changes to those made in this bill that we have. Changes made to those disqualifiers in some cases expanded the disqualifications, like for assault of a minor, making that a permanent disqualifier, while others reduced disqualifications, for example, as Representative Albright mentioned, removing incest as a disqualifying behavior. And so we do have some serious concerns with uh, especially those portions of the bill. Overall, of course, some are going to argue that this is uh, the best HHS bill to come forward. You had $19 billion to spend in it, so it should be the best HHS bill to, to come forward. But as we look at this and look at the overall uh, spending and the, the priorities that came through here, what we found is a bill that focuses on expanding government health care but does little to rein in the high cost of health care. And so with that, members, I would ask you to vote no. Thank you. Discussion. Mr. Speaker. Yes, uh, please state your name. Representative Draskowski. Representative Draskowski, you have the floor. Thank you. Would uh, the, the author of the bill yield? She will yield. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, thank you, Representative Liebling. Um, I'm uh, struggling, Representative Liebling, with the spreadsheet. Uh, do we have any information that shows us the total amount that the bill spends, uh, what the base uh, was for this planning biennium, and what the actuals are projected to be at the end of the current biennium for this bill area? I mean, we've had this in past spreadsheets, and uh, I've noted this with other bills that have come before us. This is the worst one I've seen. I, it's a tracking spreadsheet, uh, so it tracks comparisons uh, evidently against the base. Um, so you know how much over or under the base for those areas, but we aren't able to see the totals. Can you help us with that, um, Madam Chair? Representative Liebling. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Drazkowski. Well, there are a lot of questions in there, and um, I mean, the spreadsheet, uh, it is a long spreadsheet, but beginning with, I think you have to understand, first of all, that we had a $100 million target above base in each biennium, so the, the, uh, the first biennium and then the so-called tails, and so one of the issues in this bill that is probably uh, very different than what you usually see in an HHS bill is that because of the impact of the federal money, there is a lot of federal funding that is allocated in the bill. And in, it is, this is, um, it comes in different buckets. And each of these different buckets of federal funding has different requirements with it. And so one of the things that makes this bill very complicated is that there's a lot of um, so-called refinancing of items in the bill with some of the federal funding that is, and it is one-time funding. So there was, we spent a lot of time, um, and the Senate spent a lot of time figuring out how to use one-time funding in ways that will be helpful and impact the state going forward without committing us to too much ongoing spending. So I heard um, members um, uh, questioning this. Um, so I think uh, Representative Draskowski, I'm not exactly sure, again, these are detailed questions. Um, I, let me just give you some numbers that I have. I'm not sure if this exactly addresses your question, and you, maybe you could try again. but. So one of the buckets of federal funding that is used throughout this bill, mostly in the human services area, 
is um, what we are calling um, Home and Community-Based Services, HCBS. And essentially what this is is that for certain kinds of spending, the federal government is giving us an increase in um, the federal share. So in one of the things that makes HHS funding so complicated is that a lot of what we do is partly paid for by the federal government, and our spending is matched by federal spending. And so what they're doing is increasing the amount that they're reimbursing us. So in total, there is $686 million in this federal funding, which is one-time funding, but it lasts for three years. So a lot of what Representative Schultz was talking about comes from this bucket of money, which is only for three years, and which we worked hard to um, to make sure that we were um, being uh, conscientious about our ongoing obligations. Obviously, when you raise rates, those rates continue into the future. You can't stop after three years and say, oh, now the money's gone, we're gonna drop you back down by three or four dollars an hour. You just can't do that. But we were very careful and conscious to do the best we could to, um, to obligate the state in ongoing spending um, in, in ways that we, were, we believed were important to do. Um, so in addition to this, there was, um, I mentioned that our budget target was $200 million over the four years. Um, there was $58 million in COVID funds that were left over that were used to refinance um, items in our bill, so that was available for us to use as well. And then, like most bills, there were other amounts that were canceled and savings that we could find that we were able to repurpose those funds. So the total general fund um, spending in this bill, is that, that's the biennium? Is that over the biennium? Over the next biennium is 16.6 um, .6 billion is the total general fund spend over the next two, two years. And then the direct total appropriations for 22-23 are 18.8 billion. Okay, Representative Draskowski, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Representative Labeling. Uh, I, I, that you're, you're getting warmer, Representative Labeling. Uh, those are the, the numbers, I think, that Many of us are used to reading, you're used to reading, I'm used to reading as we look at these bills through the years. Um, in each of these areas that we see at the very top of the spreadsheet, um, you know, we should be able to have the, the uh, ideally, the, the, the uh, um, general fund numbers uh, and the, uh, each of the all fund um, category numbers uh, in spending for the bill. And so uh, we at least heard the, the, the big numbers and that was a great start, 16.6 billion. And I assume the 18 point something billion, billion that you iterated uh, represents um, uh, all of the spending in the bill. Um, I think it's important to note, uh, regardless of where the money comes from, whether it comes through state government or federal government, it's all taxpayer money. And so um, I, I would look forward um, and, and Representative Liebling, you don't need to yield, but if you would just um, take note, um, and Mr. Speaker and, and Chair Liebling, if we could have uh, a summary of, of that, um, of the spending by category uh, for the bill, um, that would be helpful as we look at analyzing uh, this big uh, Spendosaurus Rex that uh, Representative Garofalo articulated so well. I have the same concerns, Mr. Speaker, that Representative Garofalo outlined, I think, uh, and, and so did Representative Albright to an extent. I think we are gonna set ourselves up for failure uh, by spending like uh, drunken sailors in this bill. Uh, maybe drunken uh, Tyrannus Spendosaurus Rexes, I'm not sure, but um, anyway, that's, uh, I, I, uh, I, I just have that same frustration, as I mentioned before, not being able to see the actual numbers and. Um, I, I do, did hear that uh, the chair of the committee has them, but uh, the rest of the members do not. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Liebling. 
Okay. Uh, to the chair of the bill, uh, Representative Liebling. You're last on my list. Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. So, um, um, just to conclude on one of the earlier questions, just to uh, about the health care access fund, um, just to note that the in the February forecast, the ending uh, uh, balance for the health care access fund was zero, and this bill actually leaves thirty three point seven million in the fund. So, um, in terms of that little question, I think uh, the, the uh, concern is probably not so well founded. But Mr. Chair, I, I just want to, as I close here tonight, and thank you members for the discussion, um, I do want to say that I don't think of an HHS bill as just spending. I think of it as investment. When we make sure that our kids get off to a healthy start, that's an investment. Maybe you can't see it on a stock exchange somewhere. It's not in your mutual fund, but it makes a difference. When kids don't get lead poisoning, that impacts their ability to learn because we have taken preventive measures to make sure that doesn't happen. That's an investment in our kids. We are a state and we are a healthy state when our people are healthy, when our people have opportunities. And if, you're, if you don't get a healthy start in life, if your mother doesn't have a healthy pregnancy, if we don't make sure that our families are able to thrive, then we can't be a healthy state. So sure, we have to think about what our spending is gonna be in the future, but the best investments we can make are the investments in our people. You know, right now, there's a lot of talk about how we don't have enough workers. Well. You know, what are workers? They are our people. We, we talked a lot in an, about an education bill today. If we don't have kids who, who spend their early years in the best possible circumstances, who grow up in a healthy place, who have healthy food, who have the, the medical care they need, if we don't do those things, then we can't educate our way out of it later. So I think that this is, this is a great bill, members. This is a great bill. This bill has something in it for everybody. It really does. Those of you who care a lot about people with disabilities, this is your bill. If you care about dental care, which so many of us have worked on for so long, this is your bill. I can't imagine that anybody would be voting no on this bill. So I'm just gonna close by thanking the people I didn't thank at the outset, First of all, all of the members on the HHS committees, both majority and minority members, thank you very much for your involvement. This bill is full of provisions that many members worked on, talked about, and care about. And I'm so grateful for all of your input. Um, and then I also want to be sure to thank the commissioners, Commissioner Malcolm, who's the Commissioner of Health, what a year, what a two years she's had. And she's done just a marvelous job and her staff are just outstanding. And um, Commissioner Jody Harpstead from the Department of Human Services and her incredible staff. I've said so many times and I'll say it again here on the House floor, the people of Minnesota have no idea how blessed they are to have these wonderful public servants working for all of us. And finally, I do wanna Thank our colleagues in the Senate, Senator Benson and Senator Abler in particular, who uh, worked and struggled with us over this bill for so many weeks. Um, sometimes, of course, we got a little upset with each other. Much of the time, we were working together. And, um, and as the bill came together, I think all of us understood that this is a historic bill and that we are doing great things here for the people of Minnesota. And we're so grateful to have had this opportunity to be here at this historic moment. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I will conclude and just ask the members to please vote for the bill. Thank you. Okay. There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll.
Members, this is your chance to vote on this historic bill. Please vote. Okay, uh, will the clerk please call the names of those members who have not voted yet? Anderson. Anderson, no. Anderson, no. Baker. Uh, Baker, I. Baker, I. Berg. Berg, I. Berg, I. Bliss. Bliss, no. Bliss, no. Bolden. Bolden, I. Bolden, I. Draskowski. Draskowski, no. Draskowski, no. Edelson. Edelson, I. Edelson, I. Feist. Feist, I. Feist, I. Franzen. Franzen votes no. Franzen, no. Frazier. Frazier, I. Frazier, I. Houseman. Houseman, I. Houseman, I. Johnson. Johnson, no. Johnson, no. Mason. Mason. Mason, I. Mason, I. Quam. Quam, no. Quam, no. Richardson. Richardson votes. Richardson votes, I. Richardson, I. Swazinski. Swazinski, no. Swazinski, no. Baker switches to no. Baker changes from I to, to nay, to no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 69 ayes and 56 nays, the bill is repassed as amended by the Senate and its title agreed to. Announcements? Announcements. One second. Representative Winkler. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I regretfully announce that the Rules Committee will meet tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. And Mr. Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourn until 10.30 a.m. Sunday, June 27, 2021. Representative Winkler moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 10.30 Sunday, June 27th, 2021. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. 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 The motion prevails. Representative Winkler. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Winkler moves that the House do now adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. The motion prevails and the House stands adjourned until 10.30 Sunday, June 27th, 2021.